um, kind of popped up after watching a friend's uh, Facebook Live, him in his studio early on in COVID. Um, and I came out of that and, and said to Cinda, like, I think we're coming up on a moment where people really have a lot to share. And so I started doing this, not even really knowing how long it would last, how long COVID would last, how long the show would last. And it has just kept watching going. Watching friends, oops, 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 oops. Uh, Facebook Live, so him in his studio early on in COVID. All um, right, so let me mute this and come back over here. So yes, there have been quite a few and I'm excited that you are here today. So welcome everyone to So Ask Us this week. We're talking to Yasmin Eisenhower, who is the brand new <laughs> executive director of Amherst Cinema, who everyone is dying to know better. And I'm so excited <laughs> that you're here. Thanks for taking the time for this today. Sure, absolutely. Thank you for having me. Yes, I have to tell everyone who's watching, I think I reached out to you probably like the first or second week that you were on the job and was like, will you come on my show and talk to me? And you were like, give me a second. So <laughs> I'm psyched that this has, has come and, and come so soon and come in such a big week for Amherst Cinema. Yeah. So, yeah. right. So why don't we just start there? Because I'm sure news is starting to trickle out more and more that this Friday, things are majorly shifting. So can you share with us what is, what's happening? <laughs> so sure thank you for having me hannah i'm really <laughs> delighted to be here and um it's okay that you reached out in the first week because <laughs> you know the thing about coming on to a job and i've been in this position now for two months yeah um, i celebrated my two-month anniversary this weekend is that i'm from amherst and so i have all of these local connections and people have been so good about trying to connect me into and mm -hmm. with others. So, um, so thank you. Yeah. So yeah, this week Friday is a big deal. Amherst Cinema, after being closed for exactly one year, um, is opening up, reopening its doors to the public. Oh and so gosh. we're doing that um, through a phased reopening where we're prioritizing safety mm -hmm. and, um, and we're inviting, it's called small group ticketed screenings where parties of one to five people can come in. They have a theater that uh, they will be the only occupants in that theater for that showtime. Oh. And, uh, and we've picked uh, two films that are really Oscar nominated, meant for the big screen, meant to be seen and showing them in the way that the filmmaker was intending. Yeah. Um, so yes, uh, we have, over the next two weeks, 45 showtimes. And when we announced those showtimes last week, Friday, they were, we were sold out within 24 hours. So. Oh my gosh. Yeah. yeah. So the hunger is definitely there, which I think yeah. any movie lovers knew, but <laughs> definitely I have, I have a million questions off of that. Um, but the first one I want to ask, because I think you know, after this time of being at home and anyone who knows me knows that I am an obsessive movie lover. <laughs> um, and, you know, we've been watching a lot of things streaming, right? Streaming is like the new thing. And, and it feels reminiscent of when kind of Amazon was on the rise and everyone was really worried about the future of retail. And now it's streaming and a year of that really being one of the only options, unless you were financially able to, you know, rent out theaters and do all those things there seems to be that same quivering of like, what if movie theaters go away? And, but, you know, to your point that a lot of films, maybe not every film, they're made to be seen in theater still. So do, do you worry that the future of theaters is like gonna get usurped by streaming or do you feel like there will always be those films that people just need to see on a big screen and that will keep being true? Yeah. So that's a great question. And I will say that that is the question, right? Um, as we've been in this pandemic for over a year now, um, people have been hunkered down and have gotten very much accustomed to streaming platforms. Yeah. Streaming platforms have really seen an increase in sales. When you look at um, even Disney Plus, you know, mm -hmm. the number of subscribers and these other platforms. 
uh, we were watching this pre-pandemic. So this was not, yeah. this was not a, a new thing. And I believe that within the landscape of films and how we consume films that there are room for all kinds of models. Yeah. So there are room, there is room for streaming services. There is room for theatrical experiences, which are good for both film promotions, mm-hmm. moviegoers, et cetera. And, you know, there's room for video on demand. So, yeah. um, you know, we're watching that. I think one of the biggest yeah. changes that we'll see that we're tracking that's unknown is what that theatrical window will look like. Mm-hmm. So previously a film in its normal trajectory would be in theaters and then it would move to streaming. Right. And then eventually you could purchase it for, for ownership. Um, that changed with the rise of Netflix, yeah. which was definitely a disruptor in the industry. And the industry has had to kind of reinvent and innovate around mm-hmm. that. Yeah. I don't necessarily think it's a terrible problem to have. And certainly during the pandemic, it has been a solution in terms of people being able to consume media. For yeah. us at Amherst Cinema currently, even though we're opening on Friday, virtual cinema still is our primary mode of engagement. It's where we are releasing most of our titles and also engaging in live events with our our members and patrons. And I imagine that even after this is all done and we return to full capacity, Mm -hmm. that we will still maintain um, some footprint in virtual cinema because we've seen some opportunities in that as well. Yeah, that's interesting. So it really is, you're coming up on kind of a hybridization potentially and around, um, is it an accessibility question? Is it more just that people have responded really well to virtual platforms and why take it away? Yeah, um, I, I, I think that it is not necessarily accessibility because even the theatrical experience is, is fully accessible. Yeah. Um, it is more so when you think about the ways that we can expand. Mm-hmm. We are a four screen theater and there is right. always films and titles that are out there that we simply can't put on our screens because mm-hmm. we have a, a feature that's running that is just dominating. For example, right. Par- <laughs> Parasite way back in 2019, oh my gosh, 2020, yeah. mm-hmm. um, you know, we were running that on screen prior to the pandemic. And then, um, I mean, prior to its Oscar wins and then post Oscar wins. Right. So right. having virtual cinema allows us additional screens and additional titles that we feel is outside of mainstream that you won't find on the other streaming platforms. And so being able to give those films airtime and presence is also really important. Yes, absolutely, absolutely. Yeah. So I, the other question that I feel like I'm gonna like do a lot of this interview because <laughs> I have so many things I wanna ask. Yeah. Um, but you know, my next question kind of leading into um, thinking about you as an executive director, managing a team coming up on what is going to be a very big emotional shift in a lot of ways with opening. When you think about sort of your trajectory to this position, um, do you feel that, I'll just say, you seem to me <laughs> to be sort of the perfect person to be <laughs> in this position in this moment um, and does it feel that way to you? And, and what are the pieces of your journey that you feel like have really come together to, to put you where you are right now? Oh, well, I'm deeply flattered by you saying that. <laughs> <laughs> um, I would say that I am really excited to be in this moment at this time. I am yeah. undaunted by this moment in terms of, um, of, of how to lead this organization, organization through this time. Mm. Um, I'm committed to Amherst Cinema. I was committed to Amherst Cinema even prior to coming on as executive director. Yeah. I've lived in Amherst for seven and a half years and have been a member of the cinema as well. And I'm still a member of the cinema. Um, it is just something that I have prioritized in my life. Yeah. But in terms of preparation for this moment, I would say that, um, as a professional, I've had a very non-traditional trajectory mm. through my 
through my professional career. So one thing that is, that is a fact about me is that I'm a first generation um, born um, American. Mm -hmm. My family all come from Jamaica, West Indies. And so they came through as naturalized citizen and myself and cousins and brother were born here. And there's something about being kind of the first in the family. Mm. There was an emphasis on certain professional careers that were acceptable in my family. Right. Yeah. And so from a very early age, I thought I was going to be an attorney. Uh huh. And I actually, um, for my undergraduate years and even upon graduation, worked in a corporate law firm for a couple of oh, years. Oh, wow. Interesting. Before I realized, yeah, <laughs> not quite for me. Um, <laughs> certainly noble profession for those who do it. Um, but for me, it was something that didn't really stir my soul. Yeah. Um, and I needed more. So that's when I went back to graduate school. And um, while at NYU, I stumbled on a on an independent film festival and company and, and actually pivoted my career in that and worked for nine years in independent oh, films. Wow. And um, so while I was there, really developed this love and understanding of both how the theatrical and home video business worked, mm -hmm. um, understood the power and importance of alternative narratives in terms of mainstream representation. And, um, and then just kind of through that journey, kind of kept going, uh, pivoted into educational technology and focused on media education and worked most recently at Smith College for seven years. Right. And here I am. I was not necessarily looking, but I was a member who was always seeking to figure out ways to become involved with the cinema. We have a lot of volunteer opportunities. <laughs> and then lo and behold, I saw the ED <laughs> position advertised and I said, I, I'm going to go for that. Yeah. And so, so here I am. And in terms of preparation, I would say that all of these things, all of these different experiences have contributed to kind of the leader that I am. I had a lot of yeah. um, opportunities to do some really wonderful leadership and intentional leadership development at Smith. Mm. And, um, and so stepping into this position, also working at Smith during a crisis as well, really yeah. um, prepared me for, for where we are now. So that's awesome. That's so wonderful. And I would, if I can take it even a step further, this is one of my favorite questions to ask people, but I think so often we as human beings have trouble kind of knowing when to make a change or to make a pivot, like you say, or to follow a line of disruption. What do you look for in you know, whether it's an intellectual process or feeling it in your body a little bit that's like, yes, this is the right thing. This is the right direction. This is the right time to make a change. What signals do you follow in yourself? Hmm. I have never been asked that question. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry, that was like out of left field a little bit. I'm just no. it always so it's so fascinating to me. And I think it's something that that we need to understand better about ourselves sometimes. Yeah, no, I, I think that um for me, it's um, maybe both a combination of following opportunities that come mm -hmm. my way, as well as following joy. Yeah. And if I'm in a position where, um, you know, I see an opportunity that is speaking and resonating, yeah. then absolutely pursuing it. You know, I am somebody who gives 110% mm. wherever I am. And so totally. I like to leave a legacy and a mark in the place um, where I've been. But, um, but when it comes to Amherst Cinema, this, this feels like a full circle almost yeah. um, of beginning from a place where film was really my passion, working through media education, which is also mm -hmm. pretty mission centric to Amherst Cinema yeah. and then kind of getting here. So, um, so it is very much a leap. And when we talk about living in the moment of a pandemic, it's especially a leap as we're looking at these various studies that are coming through in terms of, um, you know, for instance, black women are the, you know, most unemployed through this mm -hmm. moment. And right. I'm a self-identified black female and um, leaving an institution that was pretty stable right. and where I had um, a really wonderful thing going into a place that was close to the public and um, public facing. 
but I have a lot of faith in Amherst Cinema. I have a lot of faith in the members and even, you know, selling out two weeks of shows within 24 hours tells me that it answers that original question, which was, will they come back? And so right. absolutely. And so here I am um, in part opportunity, in part joy, and, mm. and maybe that third part is leap of faith. Oof, I love it. I love it. <laughs> Thank you for answering that question. Sure. I really appreciate it. And I, I do see a question coming through over here. And I want to say to folks who are watching as well, we have a little bit less time today with Yasmin, obviously, because it's a big week. Um, so please be really free with your questions. Uh, don't be shy. Um, and a question coming through from Virginia, who I always have to share with my guests, is my mother and my biggest fan. <laughs> oh. <laughs> uh, she's asking, she said, uh, Hannah and I once attended a sing-along movie, Mary Poppins. Um, it was Mary Poppins' mom. She did it with a question mark. Um, do those kinds of films still exist where people come together, um, you know, and, and sing? And she's, she uh, is talking about a year or more down the road um, is that on the agenda to kind of have movies be sort of community gatherings again and to bring people together, not just to watch the movie, but also to sort of be interactive, I think yeah. is the question. So thanks for your question, Virginia, mom. <laughs> <laughs> um, I would say that at the moment uh, for Amherst Cinema, kind of really immediate phase reopening is we are, we are highly selective in terms of the films that we think are made for the big screen that people mm. might want to see beyond just their streaming platform. Yeah. And, um, but along the line, one of the things that you know is true is that when we all come out of this pandemic, when the case counts are lower, when the vaccina vaccination rates are higher, there will be a strong desire for social experiences. And yeah. so while the theater is a place of being able to see and hear stories, it's also a place of connection, mm. whether that's watching movies in the company of others, or that's watching films and having interactive experiences and opportunities for talkbacks. I imagine yeah. all of those things will return um, once we are operating at full capacity, and I think that there will be an interesting, um, you know, set of, of, of films that are coming out. I know mm -hmm. that um, George Myers, who is our uh, general manager, recently attended Sundance, and he was talking about awesome. this film that had to do with the, the quarantine COVID-19 experience. Oh, I imagine that there will be a lot of films that are coming out that address this. I mean, we're all already seeing it in our media and things that we consume, Yeah. but having opportunities to come together and really think about and potentially even process what this moment meant to us could be yeah. a fantastic opportunity. So yeah. I would say stay tuned. Yeah. I'm not sure, right? There's so many, there's certain things that are known and then yeah. there's quite a bit of unknown, but, um, but I imagine that we will look to really intentionally program um, experiences that are social in nature. Yes, that's wonderful. I'm excited to hear that as well, mom. Thank you for the question. Um, and kind of following, continuing in that vein and, and getting back a little bit to your role as executive director, you know, there's certainly the nuts and bolts of the business, but then there's also this huge piece of emotional support and emotional management. How do you balance kind of, you know, getting the task list done alongside making sure that your team who now is, you know, they're very much impacted by the public coming back in. How do you as a leader make room for making sure that that process is, you know, feeling good for everyone and inclusive of everyone? What is that process like for you? Yeah. So I'd say that um, there are, are really two things that I look at in terms of leadership style. The first is that I'm very much a human centered leader. Mm. I center the humans that I work with, the humans yeah. that we touch, prioritize um, the work that is coming down the pike and also think about that potential input. In terms of the second um, style and term that would be inclusive leadership. So throughout this process in the two months, we've been talking about what a phase reopening of Amher Cinema would look like. And the mm -hmm. very first thing that we prioritize is health and safety. We are tracking 
um, case counts in Massachusetts, which are still very high, and we're aware mm -hmm. of that, as well as vaccination rate. And I think up to today, we're 10% vaccinated in Massachusetts. Mm -hmm. And so there's still reasons to pause and proceed um, slowly and mm -hmm. cautiously. And um, inclusive leadership means that having lots of conversations with staff, both team conversations and one-on-ones to make sure that we are comfortable with any program that we are launching, that it is safe to yeah. do, that is mission aligned. It's, it's what we do as a cinema. And that at any given time, this is, is flexible, right? This is not a fixed plan. As right. new information presents itself, we can open further or scale back depending on what that means. Um, leading during a pandemic has been tricky, right? As you say, uh -huh. there are a lot of emotions that we have to navigate my emotions as well in terms <laughs> yes, of right. what does this mean? Yeah. I think that the responsibility as an executive director is really making sure that no har harm is done ever. Mm -hmm. um, we are in the business of film arts and entertainment. And um, so we're going to do that carefully. And yeah. I believe that my staff, which is a fantastic staff, has been very vocal and, um, you know, are great about self-advocating. Hmm. for both themselves and for each other. And so, yeah. um, and so this is the time to really listen yeah. and lead from a position of, of inclusivity. Yes, that is so wonderful. I appreciate you sharing that. We've been uh, more and more on this show, we've had opportunities to kind of dig into what the words, uh, you know, inclusion, diversity, equity, what these words mean in different mm -hmm. sectors. And it you know, when we're talking about entertainment, and I think about this a lot with placemaking because sort of pre-COVID placemaking was a lot of gatherings and events and that was sort of the driver. Um, and so in getting back to that and, and really thinking about how to take care of the team alongside the public when something really has to include both is just, it's such a balancing act, but it is so important, I think, to have leaders who see both sides as equally important. Right. No, absolutely. At Amherst, um, the safety and safety and well-being of the employees are as important as the safety and well-being of the public. Yeah. And what we're hoping is that when we reopen our doors on Friday, just as we've seen with our private theater rentals previously, is that there is this really this mutual understanding of cooperation. Yeah. And um, so we look forward to that. But speaking of inclusivity, you know, it was one of the drivers for this change as well. Um, since November, we have run private theater rentals that have been mm -hmm. really successful. And it's a strategy for many, both um, independent theaters as well as major, um, major chains. Yeah. But one of the things as we have seen it and experienced is that even though we had a sliding scale mm -hmm. for um, the rental fee, we just felt that it wasn't quite serving the broad spectrum of members yeah. and patrons who were previously in our theaters. Yeah. And so we decided to discontinue that fee-based, um, you know, option and yeah. instead bring it back down to the price of a movie ticket, where yeah. that way it's the cost of admission, the barrier to admission is severely reduced. Yeah. And in a time of a pandemic, just more accessible to all. So yeah. we are excited that the demand for tickets is high yeah. <laughs> and that um, we're making this available and our community has responded. Yeah. Um, That's saying wonderful. we're with you on that. Yeah. Yeah, that's fantastic. It is always good to feel like the decisions we make are responded to in that way. Are there, um, in addition to kind of, you know, tracking things in, in Massachusetts and in Western Mass, are there other markets and or cinema houses that you find yourself often looking to for either inspiration, best practices, or are there other markets that feel um, like they've really given you some guidelines on on how to move forward and vice versa people reaching out to you from other markets and saying oh I love what you did with the virtual platforming how did you do that yeah 
So I'll speak to that as well as kind of what it means um, from a local business perspective. Mm -hmm, so I've had opportunities to have conversations with um, the Amherst Chamber, Amherst yeah. Plus Chamber, as well as the Downtown Business District, because Amherst is also part of these various ecosystems. And so one of the things that we've been discussing a lot is the fact that, you know, pre-pandemic, businesses all did their thing mm -hmm. and perhaps they did their thing in a way that was somewhat siloed. Mm -hmm. And as we think about how we move forward and we move beyond, part of the commitment to one another, at least speaking from the Amherst business community perspective, yeah. is really to work in cooperation yeah. with one another and find ways to collaborate. So yeah. that's one thing. In terms of the art house and um, you know national chains, um, there are uh, national lobbying organizations that have been developed to help advocate oh, wow. as these different, um, you know, recovery and resiliency grants are presenting themselves to just advocate to our national government for assistance as we've yeah. had to shutter our venue. So, so there's cooperation on both a po political and national level. In terms of art house theaters, there has been a lot of chatter amongst our um, various listservs and really looking to crowdsource. Yeah. The markets we're watching are New York, which are major markets, New York and LA for independent film. New York opened last weekend. And wow. one of the things that delights us at Amherst Cinema is that we really are pretty much in step. The films that we're showing are in step with what we've seen in New York and the ways that we're going about it in terms of health and safety are just in line with um, wow. what these yeah. other chains are doing. So um, yeah, I've been grateful yeah. to um, people both local and nationally being very receptive to feedback and sharing. Yes, oh, that's so wonderful. It's good to feel that alignment happening. Mm -hmm. So kind of on a more, you know, obviously you're someone who enjoys film. I too obsessively love movies. <laughs> um, like, what does it mean to you at this juncture in the pandemic, you know, not only as executive director of a business, but also just as a human being, what does it mean to you to feel this reopening happening and to be able to enjoy movies again and welcome people into enjoying movies again? I mean, what do the movies themselves mean to you? Yeah. So I will tell you that most recently, um, I took my family to Amor Cinema. It had been, I think probably about 10 months since I had myself been in a theater. Wow. And um, we went in and the popcorn was popping. So we really wanted to bring back concessions. We know yeah. that Amor Cinema popcorn is a major thing. And yes. to sit through a movie without popcorn felt like right. it was just, it was prioritized popcorn. <laughs> <laughs> And so we walked into the theater and it's almost like when you see a disaster movie, any sort of post-apocalyptic movie where they've survived the arc or the underground shelter bunker and they've been in there for a year and they come out into the daylight yeah. and they rub their eyes. <laughs> That's what it was like for us going to uh. the cinema. It was just that you know, there was popcorn, we had drinks, my son took advantage of you know, full-size Kit Kats and Milk Duds. Yeah. And, and we sat in the theater and we were munching and we, the film we saw was One Night in Miami, which mm. is amazing in and of itself. And at the end, I was just like boo-hooing. And I didn't know if it was because the film touched me so deeply mm. or that the experience touched me so deeply. Yeah. I'm not exactly sure if I can disaggregate the two. It was <laughs> just magic, right? Yeah. And it was that thing that told me that this is, it's going to be okay. Yeah. We're going to get back to normal. Mm. And, um, and of course, we're doing it in a way that was safe, that is safe. Right. And, um, and we're still buzzing and talking about it. <laughs> That's so wonderful. I know exactly that feeling. I think a lot of people can probably relate to that with different things in their life opening up a little bit. Yeah. That's so yeah. wonderful. 
And I know you and I had really uh, some time to prep for this. So I know that post-apocalyptic movies are, are a genre <laughs> that you love as well. Um, are there other genres that you sort of find yourself gravitating towards and that you'll just, you could kind of watch movies in those genres over and over again? Yeah. Um, so yes, post-apocalyptic, my favorite. I like to be scared <laughs> out of my seat. Films like, this, like The Road. I don't know if you ever Ooh, saw The Road. I didn't, but I wanted to. <laughs> yeah, there, there are films that scare the life out of me, but then there are those films that are just really entertaining, like Planet of the Apes and, and you know, 2012, those kind of, kind of Hollywood uh, post-apocalyptic apocalyptic films yeah I would say that I am really open to all genres and I have Are been you? for a very long time yeah I think that it comes from probably being this this native New Yorker who had an ability who had the opportunity to see all kinds of both on-Broadway theater and off-Broadway theater experimental yeah. shows and plays I've just always been open to story and yes. so I say that good story and 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 you know, the type of films that come through both in our virtual cinema and on our um, now back in theaters are, are just stories that are about the human experience. And mm -hmm. so whether those are stories that break your heart or those are stories that get you just emotionally riled up or make you want to fall in love, I, I am a fan for well-told, well-crafted stories. Yes, absolutely. I feel the same. I feel like. What about yourself? What's your okay. favorite genre? <laughs> I love. So, I'm a huge fan of well made movies. Mm -hmm. Same thing where the story is there, um, but especially character driven. Like, I feel my background is in, is in theater, and I have learned so much from being able to embody characters. And so, when I watch a movie, I kind of want that same interaction to happen where I feel like I'm really watching someone go through something. So like Laurel Canyon is one of my favorite movies of all time mm. uh, with Frances McDormand, who I know is in Nomadland, which is one of the movies you're opening with, which I have been told over and over to see. So I will be there. <laughs> um, uh, you know, and then I also am a big fan of heist movies. I don't know if it's that I feel <laughs> yeah. that I could never pull off a heist and so must live vicariously, but, you know, the Thomas Crown Affair, both versions and, um, you know, movies where there's just a really sort of cool, good, bad guy or woman <laughs> who kind of gets away with some stuff at the end. <laughs> like, mm -hmm. I think those kinds of movies where the characters are just really well-rounded and the story is really well told. I'm, I'm always for that. And then I, I have a, I have trouble because I love to see really good films, but if it's scary or horror, I can't <laughs> do it. And so then there are these films, The Road is actually a good example where people yeah. were like, you should see it, but also you'd be too scared. And I'm like, oh no, I'm never going to be able to watch <laughs> this movie or like 28 days later, like things like that. <laughs> I know zombie films are, are the best, but <sighs> clearly the CGI and the makeup is so sophisticated. Yeah. yeah. I don't think there's anything wrong with watching movies. Like this. <laughs> you know, it's part of my movie strategy, depending on what it is. So yep. I'm not ashamed to say that, but yeah, no, uh, Right. Zombie films are, to pick are, and are difficult. <laughs> yeah. yeah. So, but yeah, thank you for asking that. I definitely, <laughs> you know, I think I feel that I consume movies and I think many people do to better understand one another. Mm -hmm. So that's always what I like to come away yeah. with. And I'm, I'm curious and I know we're, we're running out of time. If anyone else has a question, please feel free to, to slip it in there and I'll, I'll just ask one more as well. How do you, you know, coming up on reopening, how do you hope to interact with sort of people's experiences of, of being back? Do you think about, you know, either recording or gathering those stories somehow? Or I'm so curious about sort of capturing the moment, though I know you're also incredibly busy. Right. Yeah. <laughs> no. So um, I, I'm going to continue to say that, you know, prioritizing health and safety. Yeah. And so yeah. we are, are acutely aware of how many people are in the building or the space at any given time. We want yeah. to give plenty of space to people to feel um, secure, to feel uh, 
to have have an experience where they're not thinking about that. But we yeah. are considering um, some sort of post screening um, survey mm. that we're working on to find out, you know, why are people coming back? Is it because yeah. it's a theater? Is it that you want normalcy? Is it the right. film itself? You know, what is it about the experience? And also inviting those who've had the experience to give us feedback in terms of ways that we might improve. Sure. But I think that for, for us, it really is a satisfaction in knowing that we can, in a very significantly reduced capacity, allow people to have an experience that feels normal. Yeah. Um, and to see a film that was meant to be seen theatrically and uh, go home and spread the word. You know, yeah. we will be releasing tickets every Friday. And, um, and while there's not inventory right at this moment coming soon, I'm just hoping to bring, bring people back. So, um, so we'll see what it means yeah. to capture. That's so yeah. wonderful. Yeah. And what are the best ways for people to keep up with things? Website, social media, Sure. Okay. Yeah. So I would say that um, www.amorcinema.org is Definitely. our website. Our most current information is posted there. And while there, you can also sign up for our weekly uh, newsletter. We have a mm -hmm. newsletter that gets pushed every Friday with events that are happening, both live events, virtual cinema, and in theater experience. And as well, we have occasional uh, communications that go out to our list about special events that are happening. Um, so on March 18th, for instance, uh, Lindsay, Representative Lindsay Sabadosa and I will be doing a lobby talk, which is our virtual way of saying, see a movie that's offered in our virtual cinema and let's just talk about it. Uh -huh. And so the movie that has been selected is called Inquiring Nuns. It's a kind of cinema verte style of these nuns who did kind of man on the street interviews for people just asking them, are you happy? And so we're gonna have a lobby talk on the 18th um, just to talk about both the film and explore this idea and notion of happiness and, and what it means, particularly at this time. Yeah. So, so yes, our website, and then I would encourage people to sign up for our newsletter as well. Wonderful. Awesome. And I will, for folks who are watching, I'll post links in the notes on, on this show so you can go and sign up for everything and stay up to date and become an Amherst Cinema member. It really is worthwhile and it supports the cinema and it also just, you know, it feels good. I think yeah. and you get free popcorn. Don't you you free do. Popcorn? You do. There are all kinds of membership perks. We yes. offer discounts on our virtual cinema tickets. We offer discounts in person. So those movie ticker prices, you don't pay general admission, you pay member pricing and um, yes, free popcorn. Free popcorn, most importantly, underscore free popcorn. <laughs> Yasmin, thank you so, so much for coming on today and spending time with us. I hope this week continues to just be exciting and go smoothly for you and your team oh, and the public you. and everybody. Thank you so much. Thank you, Hannah. It was great talking to you and You're I will uh, see you at the movies. You will. You will. <laughs> All right. Thank awesome. you. Awesome. Have okay. a great rest of your day. All right. You too. Bye. Bye.